Welcome to Wine for Normal People, the podcast for people who like wine, but not the snobbery that goes with it. I'm your host, Elizabeth Schneider, author of the Wine for Normal People book and certified wine dork. This podcast is brought to you by my exclusive sponsor, Wine Access. Go to wineaccess.com slash normal and join my wine club with Wine Access. You get four shipments a year, six bottles for 150 bucks. I pick them all out. I'm in the process right now of doing the last one for the year. Get some great wines for the holidays. Don't miss out on this. Sign up today, wineaccess.com slash normal. Listen in the middle of the show for more details. This is the third in the series of great miniseries refreshes that is going to complete the trifecta. We started out with Cabernet Sauvignon, which is the child, and then I decided to do the parents. So we did Cabernet Franc last week. We are going to do Sauvignon Blanc this week. So episode 535 was Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc 538, Sauvignon Blanc now 539. Now, if you drink any wine at all, You know Sauvignon Blanc, and you know that Sauvignon Blanc has character. Now, you might love that character. You might hate it. But here's the thing about Sauvignon Blanc. You know what you're getting when you have a wine made from this grape. It can be citrusy and acidic and minerally from a cooler climate like the Loire Valley, or it can be fruitier and sometimes oak-aged in Bordeaux, some very serious styles or some very light citrusy styles. Or it can be the flagship Sauvignon Blanc style, that very strong, spicy, grapefruit noted, sometimes grassy version with tropical notes from New Zealand. Wherever Sauvignon Blanc grows, it makes an impact. It is not a shrinking violet. It's grown in a lot of places. It's grown in more than 30 countries. And there's 123,000 hectares or 300,000 acres of Sauvignon Blanc in the world. It is the 11th most planted wine grape in the world. And one third of Sauvignon Blanc is in France. Sauvignon Blanc has its quirks, but it's all about purity. It's not so much about the winemaking magic, but more about purity and the soils and how to make it shine through and have these crystal clear flavors. It is appreciated for its simplicity, just these perfect, really easy to identify. Like if you're taking a blind tasting, it's so easy to figure out which one is Sauvignon Blanc. I mean, out of all the wines, and I really, really don't like blind tasting. I get in my own head. I think blind tasting is really stupid. So I keep telling myself, this is so dumb. Why am I doing this? Story for another time, my own psychology. But I will tell you, Sauvignon Blanc is the grape that is just so easy to describe. It's easy to pick out. Like when you first get into wine, it's easy to be like, okay, that's a Sauvignon Blanc. I know what that is. It's easy. Now it is versatile. It makes dry whites and oaky whites and simple whites and complex whites. And it also makes sauterne and botrytis affected sweet wines. But whatever it is, it's got great acidity. It's got great flavor. And it is a powerhouse. So of course it's a parent of Cabernet Sauvignon, which is the king of the reds. Sauvignon Blanc is so very important in the world of white wines. Not that much grows in the area that I will be going to next week, which is Tuscany. I'll be going with a group of patrons to Tuscany, and it's going to be an amazing trip, really great opportunities to meet producers and taste wines that you wouldn't normally taste. And that's what these patron trips are all about. They're so fun. I just love them. I love hanging out with the patrons and getting to know people in a small group. We need to do some patron shout outs to our most recent patrons because we can't do this show without them. It's a patron of the arts model. You get a lot of great stuff in the community, lots of content and fun activities. We're doing a live event in Washington, D.C. Really great to see the community getting together live, and we'll be doing more of those as time goes on. So if you want to join, please think about doing it and support this podcast. Otherwise, it can't keep going. So I need to thank Danielle, Francis S., Maggie C., BK, Courtney M., Emily W., Daniel M., Karen P., Lucas W., Sham S., We S., Andrea H., Brian T., 
Andrew, Brittany I, Carl, Michelangelo P, and Kitty C. Thank you, everybody, for joining. And I hope to see you, if you are not currently a member, on Patreon. I really, really appreciate the support. So back to Sauvignon Blanc. One thing that I want to bring up here is that as we're talking about Sauvignon Blanc, it is really important to say that this grape has been around for a really long time. But the thing that made the world take Sauvignon Blanc really seriously is New Zealand. And we rarely see a new world country. I think we could say that with Argentina and Malbec also, but we rarely see this happen. An old established grape that was doing things that were good. People like Sancerre, they like Puy Fume, but New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc was a revelation for this grape. They started making it in 1980. I'll tell you more about it when we get to the New Zealand section. But this was a grape that made people immediately get it, love it. It's easy to get on board. And I think the thing about New Zealand is that because it was a relatively new region and it just got popular in the 90s, new terroir, crystal clear flavors, it was easy to feel like you were kind of getting in on the ground floor that was more approachable. You could really get behind New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. So this grape owes a debt of gratitude to New Zealand and vice versa, because I think it helped make New Zealand's wine industry as well. But we can't say Sauvignon Blanc and not New Zealand in the same podcast, almost in the same sentence. And today the grape is so popular. There's an international competition called the Concours Mondial du Sauvignon or World Sauvignon Blanc competition that celebrates the grape. I'm going to cover all of the ins and outs But let's talk about the history. Sauvignon Blanc is likely from the Loire Valley. With Cabernet Franc and with Sauvignon Blanc, it's kind of confusing because they've been bumping around Bordeaux and southwest France for a while, also the Loire Valley. So it's hard to pin it down. But the name comes from Sauvage, which is French for wild because the leaves look like wild grapevine leaves, and blanc, which means white. The earliest mention in literature was under the synonym fier in 1534 by Francois Rabelais in his book Gargantua. Now, Rabelais was from the Loire Valley, humanist and an author, very important in the world of Loire and very important in the world of French literature. So 1534 was our first mention of Sauvignon Blanc. It became Sauvignon Fumé or Blanc Fumé in 1783 to 1784 in Sancerre and Puy Fumé. It was not mentioned in Bordeaux until much later. The grape is definitely related to the Savagnin grape. I know I'm saying that wrong for you French speakers, but it's S-A-V-A-G-N-I-N. It's Savignon, but it's said the same way as Savignon Blanc. So I'm going to call it Savignin, even though I know that's not correct, because you need to be able to hear that difference, okay? Savignin was mentioned earlier in literature than Sauvignon Blanc. So it is probably the parent, because we know there's a parent-offspring relationship. We don't know who the other parent of Sauvignon Blanc is. If Sauvignon is the parent, then Sauvignon is from Northeast France. So we can say that probably Sauvignon, who is its child, is also from the Centre Loire or thereabouts because it wouldn't have traveled far. Pinot Noir would be the grandparent of Sauvignon Blanc, also, through Savignin, Sauvignon Blanc will be related to Grunewald Liener, which we could definitely see those similarities. Petit Mansang, which has a lot of pretty tropical and floral notes. Silvaner, which we see in Germany a lot. Verdelo in Portugal. Gewürztraminer, all of that through that Savignin connection. Sauvignon Blanc is a sibling of Chenin Blanc, which is the other big white of the Loire Valley, related to Trousseau or Bastardo in Portugal. Trousseau is in the Jura. There's also a color mutation of Sauvignon Blanc called the Sauvignon Gris. When we talk about Bordeaux, I'll mention this again. It's pink. It has lower yields, more alcohol, but it has less aroma. It is less strong in those green pepper, methoxy, pyrazine, that chemical that causes that green pepper note. And there is some in Bordeaux, also in Chile, and they use it. They use it proudly. So Sauvignon Gris is an approved grape in Bordeaux for whites. And it is a color mutation, but it also has some different properties. Sauvignon Blanc is an easy grape to grow. It's late budding, so no worries about spring frost, early to mid ripening, no worries about the bookends. You don't have to worry about rain or fall frosts. 
it's coming in off the vine. It's doing well. Not a really long growing season. The biggest problem is actually that it is so vigorous. So the yields are going to be really essential to the character of the wine. It doesn't have a lot of problems in the vineyards. There's some wood diseases like the Esca and you type a dieback, which are going to cause some trunk disease issues. Powdery mildew can be an issue. But for the most part, you have these small compact bunches that are incredibly susceptible to botrytis, which you want in Sauternes and Barsac and all of the sweet wine regions. Not so great in a place like the Loire Valley, but if you keep the yields tight and you do vineyard management, you should be just fine. Small yields are very important if you're thinking about quality Sauvignon Blanc. If you want, for instance, in Bordeaux, a weighty, fruity wine. You have to have smaller yields. So in Grave and in Pesach Landon, and if you have no idea what I'm talking about, don't worry, I'm going to explain all this. The grapes have to get a lot of flavor. you got to keep the yields low because you're going to put them in an oak barrel, most likely, if they're not for young, easy drinking wines. But if you are going to put these things in an oak barrel, you better make sure the grapes have a ton of flavor. And that is why you keep the yields low in Bordeaux. New World Yields, I'll just give you the numbers. They have a maximum yield of about 108 hectoliters per hectare in California and Chile's Central Valley. In Sancerre, it's 68 hectoliters per hectare as the maximum yield. And in Chile's coastal region, it's 80 hectoliters per hectare. So again, it's 20% lower in Chile and 30% lower in Sancerre. That's going to make a big difference in quality. Now, I will say that even though those big yields, you can definitely tell there's less flavor if you have those big yields, it doesn't necessarily result in undrinkable wine. Because the tip that I always give people is like, if you're stuck with all cheap, gross wines, get the Sauvignon Blanc. Because most likely it will have some flavor and it will be okay. It's going to have a little bit of character. So even at high yields, it can have a lot of character. There's some other issues though, because it's a climate-driven variety, just like its kid, Cabernet Sauvignon. And there is, if you want to make good Sauvignon Blanc instead of just Sauvignon Blanc. You have to find the balance of acidity, ripeness, aroma. This is really hard to do because of the way that Sauvignon Blanc functions in the vineyard. Let's just go the extreme and say if it's too hot, the grapes are going to ripen really quickly and then you won't have time for flavor to develop. So you'll have some acidity, but it's going to be kind of flat and boring. Where it does best are places that have maritime climates or continental climates where you get some diurnal temperature swings, you have some coolness, you need some coolness, you need some reprieve so the acidity can stay around in Sauvignon Blanc. So we take cooler climates, you have slower ripening. This would be like Chile's coastal regions or parts of New Zealand. It's going to take work because the grapes are going to ripen slowly over a longer growing season. The work is going to be in the canopy management because the longer that these grapes stay on the vine, the more the canopy really wants to grow. It gets very leafy. You have to make sure that you're staying on top of that so that the leaves don't shade the grapes and the grapes can actually ripen. So in a cool, sunny climate, you just have to make sure that you're very diligent because you need that sun to get the grapes ripe. In more moderate climates, you're going to need a cooler site or a mitigating factor. You either need some altitude, you need ocean breezes and a maritime climate. You'll be able to maintain that acidity in Sauvignon Blanc, which is essential. Sauvignon Blanc is incredibly expressive of terroir, But again, only when it's capped at lower yields. It can crop to these high levels. And then you have to make sure that the grape has infertile soils, the rootstock controls vigor, trellising and canopy management, you're on top of it, and that you know what soil types are going to yield different flavors. And when we do the individual regions, I'll talk about that, especially regarding Sancerre. Picking decision is another thing. I always talk about picking decision, but with Sauvignon Blanc, here's the deal. So the best aroma, the aroma that you really want out of Sauvignon Blanc is going to happen right before the sugars are balanced with acidity. And if you let the grapes hang on the vine, you're going to have less acidity 
And you might have the right flavors, but the acidity might not be imbalanced with the alcohol. So this is a huge problem. So growers, some of them, will just pour bags of tartaric acid into the vat. But sometimes you can tell because it just tastes a little bit off. It doesn't taste fully integrated. So that's not really a great solution. If you wait for it to get too ripe, it's going to get almost oily and flat. Sauvignon Blanc is not a winner in warmer regions, even though, as I always say, just because you can do it doesn't mean you should. Obviously, it's super vigorous. So in the flat Central Valley of California, they're growing a ton of Sauvignon Blanc, but it's too hot. You're getting a lot of flat flavor. They might pick a little bit earlier, or they might just add a lot of tartaric acid to try to get that acidity back into Sauvignon Blanc. Picking date in better regions is always going to be a compromise between the sugar, which will eventually be alcohol, and the acidity, but that can make or break Sauvignon Blanc. So are you going for less ripeness and great aroma, but very high acidity? Or are you going for less aroma, tropical flavors? So one compromise that is done both in Chile and New Zealand is to pick Sauvignon Blanc at different times. It's called tree, and they actually do this in Sauterne. So you'll do a pick when the grapes are high in malic acid and not quite ripe, almost ripe, but not quite ripe. So you'll get that great acidity. The middle stage, you might get some methoxy pyrazine green pepper notes, or you might get beautiful aromas of peach and herbs and thyme and sage. And then later, you'll have lower acidity, but you won't have any of those green notes. And the grapes will give you more peachy tropical notes. So you might blend all of those together to make a perfect wine. Then you don't really have to trade acidity for aroma. It's always a compromise. You really have to know what to do in the vineyard because winemaking is not very extensive with Sauvignon Blanc. So making sure the canopy is managed and that you know what you're doing in terms of picking is a really important strategy for making good Sauvignon Blanc. In the winery, here's a fun story. They do skin contact sometimes. Where they do skin contact a lot of times is in New Zealand. And this is because it's become a tradition. So in New Zealand, at the beginning, in the 1970s, when they first planted an experimental vineyard of Sauvignon Blanc in Marlborough, there were no wineries. I mean, it was empty. There was nothing, nothing, nothing there. There was nowhere to process the grapes. So they had to take the grapes, truck them to a boat, and then bring them up to the North Island, a lot of times to Auckland, to process the grapes and turn them into wine. Well, as the grapes were sitting there waiting, the weight of the grapes on top of each other causes grapes to burst, and then you have some skin contact with the juice. That is actually created some nice gooseberry, lime, green pepper, grassy notes, and that was preferred. So some people still do that to this day. They found that it made a really nice character in the wine. So that is popular in New Zealand. It's popular in some other New World areas too. Once you're in the winery, fermentation temperature, essential. In France, they do warmer fermentations. That tends to bring out minerality, chalkiness, more citrus notes. It doesn't really matter whether you do it in steel or in wood. If you're going to have a warmer fermentation, you're going to avoid tropical notes. That warmer fermentation is like 16 to 18 degrees Celsius or 61 to 64 degrees Fahrenheit. You'll have less fruit and then you will have more of these other kinds of notes. This Warmer fermentation is, of course, coming from before temperature-controlled tanks. So this is more traditional. This is how they used to do it before climate change came along and made it very warm. And also how traditionally they would ferment things at a warmer temperature before they had the ability to cool things down. So this makes a lot of sense. In Bordeaux, they do it the same way, except they generally ferment in a barrel to give more richness to the wine. In the New World, they prefer cooler fermentations. In stainless steel, they're going to get more citrus notes, but a lot of tropical notes as well. There's other winemaking that you can do. The storage after fermentation, are you going to store it in oak to round out the acidity? But then you might get vanilla, clove, smoke notes that you might not want. The fruit might not be able to stand that. Maybe it can. It just depends on the type of oak, the age of the oak, the kind of fruit you have in it. All that matters. They definitely age the wine on the lees surly aging to round out the mouthfeel, make it softer. 
Malolactic fermentation generally frowned upon, especially in Sancerre and Puy Fume in the Loire. Some years they'll do it if the acidity is too harsh. In New Zealand, a portion of the wine will sometimes go through malolactic fermentation. It depends on the producer. The other thing is, do you blend the wine? In most places, it is pure Sauvignon Blanc. In Bordeaux, no. In Sauterne, which is part of Bordeaux, no. You are going to blend it with Semillon and Muscadel. And the pure fruit notes of Sauvignon Blanc are important, but less important than Semillon in many cases. Now, they do make 100% Sauvignon Blanc in parts of Bordeaux, but just a different mentality. Bordeaux is all about the blends. So it should make sense that especially at the high end, they are going to blend that with their other grapes. What does the grape taste like? I think you know. I'll just give you some ideas of some styles and talk about why the things taste the way they do. But Sauvignon Blanc is yellow to nearly colorless sometimes in the glass depends on how much skin contact how ripe the grapes got light to medium bodied as i discussed already the flavors are obvious they're easy to describe it's such a great first wine it can make you feel really good about yourself because hey i know this is sauvignon blanc high acidity some green notes except in hotter climates. So there's several categories of flavors for Sauvignon Blanc. The typical green notes, that's green pepper and jalapeno. The methoxypyrazines is a chemical that produces that in Cabernet Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon, and Sauvignon Blanc. It can make the wine taste like asparagus or peas, grass, leaves, kiwi, high acidity. Then you have big fruit and tropical notes. You'll find this more often in warm climates. California is really known for this Sauvignon Blanc style. White peach, melon, fig, and pineapple, and generally speaking, lower acidity. Now, these two styles are actually a conflict between which aromatic and flavor compounds you want in the wine. There are compounds called thiols. These are compounds that are formed after fermentation by the sulfur, which is produced by fermentation, and the yeast interacting. It can also be in the fruit before fermentation, but it's influenced by yeast and the enzymes in the fermentation. And that is going to cause some really great notes like tropical fruit, grapefruit, flint, and smoke. It can also do cat pee, which is a very common descriptor of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. Not so great sometimes, so you can't go crazy with the theols. And then there's the conflict between that and the methoxypyrazines, which are associated with green bell pepper notes, and that is compound that is part of Sauvignon Blanc. That gives those grassy green pepper jalapeno aromas, and that is going to be very, very typical of the grapes. So if you want theols, you're going to do a warmer fermentation. If you want methoxypyrazines, you might do no malolactic fermentation and just pick the grape early because the pyrazines are higher the younger the grape is. Also, if you overcrop the grape, you will get a lot of pyrazines. There are so many styles. You have, in cooler climates, mineral-driven wines. Those are the ones that are smoky and flinty and chalky. Again, those theols, the high acidity Sancerre, Puy Fume, Sauvignon Blanc from Tasmania in Australia, warmer fermentations, right? Those are those mineral-driven wines. Then you have citrus-driven wines. They may not pick up the flinty, smoky character, but they pick up very, very strong citrus notes. So lemon, lime, grapefruit, green apple, gooseberry, tangy acidity, unoaked white Bordeaux, simple white Bordeaux, Chilean Sauvignon Blanc would be good examples of things that are very citrus-driven. Then you have your grassy, herbaceous pyrazine bombs, tomato leaf, green pepper, minty, cut grass, sautéed herbs. I really love when that note, that kind of like tarragon thyme note in butter, mm, that flavor tastes so good to me. But the wines are usually crisp and acidic, so it's a contrast. And this is classic New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, South African Sauvignon Blanc. The only issue to balance some of that acidity, they might leave some residual sugar or add residual sugar back into the wine. And the way that they do that is they might put unfermented grape must from the same batch into the wine. It's grape juice, but it will add sugar to the blend. 
Sometimes they'll just actually just dump sugar in there. <laughs> they can do that too in the new world. No restrictions. Then there's oaked Sauvignon Blanc or Sauvignon Blanc Semillon blends. I'm talking about oaked white Bordeaux with Semillon, fresh churned butter, lemon curd, chamomile notes, delicious. And then you have the botrytized wines like the Sauterne Sauvignon Blanc blends, which are going to give you pineapple and apricot and honey marzipan. But the great thing about those wines, if you've never had a Sauterne, it's someday you, hopefully you'll have one, you'll notice that the acidity is so high that it doesn't exactly taste sweet. These wines are really special for that reason. When Sauvignon Blanc ages, if it is oak aged and appropriate, it might taste like honey and toast and a little bit less fruity. You won't have those pyrazine notes quite as much. Let's get to the regions. France, New Zealand, Chile, South Africa, the U.S. These are the largest producers of Sauvignon Blanc, according to the Organization of Wine and Vine. France is one of the largest producers of Sauvignon Blanc, 30,000 hectares or 74,000 acres. It's Only 4% or a little bit less than 4% of France's vineyard area, but it is growing and it's an important grape in France. Sauvignon Blanc really made a mark. When vineyards were replanted after phylloxera, Sauvignon Blanc became the toast of the town in Paris as a bistro wine. Simple and elegant, high acidity, great with food. Sancerre and Puy Fume are close to Paris and they supplied this wine in droves. Sancerre is not that big. It's 7,400 acres or 3,000 hectares. 70% is exported. Puy Fume, which is across the river, is only 1,400 hectares or about 3,500 acres. And most of that actually stays in France. So big difference. Wine growing has been around in these two areas since at least the 4th or the 5th century. But Really, Sauvignon Blanc, as I mentioned, is a 20th century phenomenon. Mostly just used to be Pinot Noir in this area. Sauvignon Blanc is unblended, it is not oak aged, and it is terroir driven. The Loire, especially in the central vineyards, which is what Sancerre Puy Fume area is called, has a cool continental climate. And the Loire is here. And there's tributaries, and that's going to add to the airflow. It's going to add some cool air. The central vineyards have the biggest diurnals in the Loire. It can be 50 degrees Fahrenheit swing or 26 degrees Celsius, if I got that conversion right, in the summertime. you got a giant swing, slow ripening. That means that the grapes are going to take a while to warm up in the morning. So even if it's sunny and hot in the summertime and you have this shorter growing season, at night, the grapes can hoard acidity and they can take their time in ripening. The fall is generally mild, but the issue is with humidity and fog. And because Sauvignon Blanc is susceptible to botrytis and you do not want that in Sancerre au Puy Fume, you got to get the grapes ripe and off the vines as soon as you can. I talked about Wine Access at the beginning of the show. They are my exclusive sponsor. They help make this podcast free for you, and they are an awesome partner. If you are looking for interesting wines and a vast selection, but one that is highly curated so you're not completely overwhelmed, Wine Access is the way to go. They taste thousands of wines. They have a highly qualified team, and the wines that they bring in aren't people trying to get rid of wines. They are wines that are specifically sourced for the site to give you access to things you can't get locally. You can go to wineaccess.com slash WFNP. That'll get you into the site. Let them know you heard about them through me. And you will see that there are wines there that you might be thinking, oh my gosh, I heard Elizabeth talk about that on the show and I've never seen it. Or I read about that wine and now I can buy it. And if you join the Wine Access Wine for Normal People Wine Club, I will pick out wines for you that are of exceptional quality, 150 bucks for six bottles four times a year. I do the tasting videos that are available on Wine Access's YouTube. Get on it today, wineaccess.com slash normal to join that wine club and get limited edition wines that you can't get access to anywhere else. Wineaccess.com slash WFMP to go peruse the site. If you become a wine club member, you get 10% off 
all your purchases. It's a great deal, 150 bucks four times a year, plus 10% off everything else you buy. Wine Access is the go-to place for people in the wine industry. See why, wineaccess.com slash normal. Don't forget, I am about to post up classes through the end of the year. It's $30 per person, Great way to spend time with a community of wine lovers learning. I will be there. It is live. It's a fun show on a Saturday night, usually. There's one coming up that is in the UK, EU friendly time zone, the wines of Italy. Don't miss out. Go to winefornormalpeople.com slash classes and check it out today. Sign up. If you're a patron, you get a discount on classes. Don't forget Patreon. I mentioned it at the beginning of the show. Patreon.com slash wine for normal people. But if you're looking to sign up for classes, you need to go to my website, not Patreon's winefornormalpeople.com slash classes. And now let's get back to the show and Sauvignon Blanc. It is quite hilly and sometimes very steep. So unlike some other areas of the Loire, you have a lot of different exposures and microclimates within these Appalachians of the center Loire. Sancerre, 100% Sauvignon Blanc from the hills around the Loire and its tributaries. This is in the center of the country of France. That's why it's the central vineyards. This is the steepest and best vineyards in the towns of Sancerre. Bouet, Chavignol, Champtine. Elevation and orientation are incredibly important, but the soil types for Sauvignon Blanc in Sancerre are style cues. There are three main soil types. There's alluvial gravel and sand in the area because you have the banks of the Loire and the Cher River, and that's going to give you simpler wines. But the really serious wines are made from three soil types. The first one is the Cayote or the Griot. This is calcareous limestone soil, small stones. The Sauvignon Blanc is going to be fruitier, very aromatic, a little chalky, lower in acidity, kind of bigger wines. Then you have the Terre Blanche. The Terre Blanche is Kimmeridgian sedimentary rock from the sea with fossilized oysters and sea creatures in it. It's like Champagne and Chablis. It actually sometimes is confusing because the Sancerre from Terre Blanche can taste like Chablis. Sauvignon Blanc is mineral-driven, high acidity, beautiful perfumed floral notes, restrained. These wines can age for up to 10 years. And then you have the most rare of the three, only about 20%. The other two are about even between the Coyote and the Terre Blanche, but Silex is only about 20% of the soil here. It's flinty clay. It gets heated up by the sun. The wines tend to be lighter and elegant with acidity, and they have a very distinctive smoke note or gun flint note. They have great aging potential. They are rare. They can be outstanding. I mean, really, really blockbuster wines that taste like nothing else. Great Sancerre producers, Alphonse Melo, Louis Benjamin Didier Dagano. Didier Dagano was a very famous producer, unfortunately passed away early. His son has taken over that property. Domaine Vacheron, François Cotat, Vincent Gaudry, expensive wines, very impressive. Dagano makes amazing wines. Actually, really, Dagano is the king of Puy Fume, though, which is across the river on the opposite bank of the Loire from Sancerre. And the soil types are similar to Sancerre, but there's a lot more flint in Puy Fume than Sancerre. So they do have Caillot and Terre Blanche, but that flinty note is stronger because there's more flint. So again, Dagano is a good producer in Puy Fume, Chateau de Tracy, and Henri Bourgeois is another one that you might want to look for if you're interested in trying real top quality. Puy Fume, which is more mineral driven and those warmer fermentations. Menetou Selon is another area that's southwest of Sancerre. It's more gently rolling, less extreme slopes, a little bit more spread out than Puy Fume and Sancerre, which are in very concentrated areas. But it also has Kimmeridgian limestone, and the wines can be beautiful, like chamomile and flowers and citrus and spice, beginning to rival Sancerre. You can look for Domaine Gilbert or Domaine Henri Pellet, Chantenoy are a couple. And then there are some outlying areas, Cancy and Rouli, which are kind of like simpler versions of Sancerre and Puy Fume. Again, 100% Sauvignon Blanc, maybe more citrusy, white peppery in Cancy, more floral, bigger in Rouli. Really nice wines, 100% Sauvignon Blanc. Great examples of Loire Valley fruit. Now we move to Bordeaux. 
Sauvignon Blanc moved to Bordeaux and then mated with Cabernet Franc to have Cabernet Sauvignon. Huge contribution to the wine world. Very important in white blends. Again, Bordeaux, all about the blends. Some varietal wines, but basically all about the blends. Maritime climate near the Atlantic. We talked about that a lot in the Cabernet Franc episode. Warmed by the Gulf Stream, you have consistent temperatures, hot summers, but some ocean breezes, and also these three large rivers, the Garonne, the Dordogne, and the Gironde, are going to add to a lot of airflow and cool down the area, adding some breezes. The farther you get from the ocean, the warmer it gets. And certainly the Bordelais are very worried about the lack of acidity in white wines as the climate warms. So they may need to change some of the places that they are sourcing the grapes from. But there's only a few places where the whites can thrive. Again, you're also getting less money for them than the reds. So they're kind of relegated to second string. The soils have to be well-drained, but then have some water retention. Sauvignon Blanc doesn't like a lot of water stress. If there is no water, you're not going to have a lot of good aroma. And of course, Sauvignon Blanc is blended with the fatter, richer Semillon. Sauvignon Blanc, it's much better than it used to be. They have identified better clones. The wines, the whites of Bordeaux are way better. Basic Bordeaux can be 100% Sauvignon Blanc. It can be a blend with Semillon or Muscadel. It adds acidity to Sauterne. There's a couple of different wines you can look for if you want to try Sauvignon Blanc from Bordeaux, which I would highly recommend if you find either that Sancerre is too acidic or Pouille Fumé are too acidic, or if you want something that is just a little bit more robust for cooler weather, Bordeaux is perfect for that. Sauvignon Blanc is a key player in the early drinking wines. They use less Semillon, so Bordeaux Blanc Bordeaux Blanc Superior, AOC, there's Chateau Reignac is the best known for really high quality Bordeaux Blanc. Then you have the wines of the Entre du Mer. If it says Entre du Mer, AOC, that's only used for dry whites. And those are delightful. Most of them are almost 100% Sauvignon Blanc. And they're very easy drinking and super inexpensive, like 12 bucks US, light wines, citrus notes, grapefruit, things like that, nice bright acidity. If you're looking for good basic Bordeaux producers, Chateau Margeau, Chateau Grand Portel, Chateau Eau La Perriere, three really good producers. The Côte de Bordeaux, such a steal. There's such great wines. Only 3% white out of the Côte de Bordeaux, but they can be really awesome. Bly Côte de Bordeaux and Franc Côte de Bordeaux and saint Foy Côte de Bordeaux Blanc. Sauvignon Blanc is a big proportion, especially in Bly. They're herbal, they're citrus, good acidity, good minerality. Chateau Eau Cantaloupe is one that I buy frequently. So you can look for that. Montfollet Le Valentine is another. Just make sure it says Blanc on it if it's from the Côte de Bordeaux. And then there's these very serious, dry Bordeaux Blanc wines. But I hesitate to really say in the world of Sauvignon Blanc that they're so important because these wines really are mainly Semillon with Sauvignon Blanc. We've got wines of Grave, which are dry medium body. This is in the southern portion down the river, down the Garonne River. Grave is very famous for its gravelly soils. Grow some excellent red grapes. Cabernet Sauvignon does well here, so does Merlot. In the world of whites, though, Grave is pretty famous for these dry, medium-bodied wines, usually more Semillon than Sauvignon Blanc. Dried fruit notes, great acidity, sometimes oak-aged, Chateau de Chantegrive is one. Um, Bernard Magres, La Homme de Pape Clément. Pape Clément makes an amazing white, super expensive. And then the sub area of Pesac Leonon, which is where Chateau Aubriand, one of the first growths of Bordeaux, is. It used to be part of Grave, broke off in 1987. The terroir was honestly better and very distinct. That's where all of the top wines come from in this area. Honestly, Grave is good, but Pesach Leonon is better. And the wines are mostly Semillon, but 25% of the blend is required to be Sauvignon Blanc. So you will always get some Sauvignon Blanc in Pesach Leonon. And the wines here are much more complex than those of Grave, nutty, toasty from the surly aging white flowers, fresh churned butter, peachy. They're often oak-aged, so you may get some vanilla and caramel notes. 
They can age for 10 years or more. Some more affordable producers, Chateau Carbonu Blanc, is a delicious wine. I mean, it's still like 40 US dollars, but very good. Chateau La Tour Martiac Blanc. Smith O Lafitte, also very pricey in reds and whites, but they make a Blanc Domaine de Chevalier. Also is another one for Pesach Leonon if you want to lay down some cash. And of course, Sautern. Sautern needs Sauvignon Blanc for the acidity. These wines are botrytized. The grapes are botrytized. We did an episode on Sautern and Barsac if you want to listen to it, but Barsac, Lupiac, Saron, Cadillac, Saint Croix du Mont, they all make sweet wines. And Sauvignon Blanc is essential for the acidity in the blend. Yes, it turns into apricot and marzipan flavors, but the key role of Sauvignon Blanc and Sautern is that acidity in the blend. Chateau Climane, Chateau de Farge, of course, Chateau d'Aquem, but who can afford that? Chateau Doisy Dane, also very expensive, Caillou, all really great. You can find a Sauterne near you and you can see what the percentage of Sauvignon Blanc is to sort of see its impact in the blend, which is really important. Others in France, there's a ton of Sauvignon Blanc in the Languedoc Roussillon. It's really hot. Got to lose a lot of flavor, lots of acid being added to those wines. You got to figure in Gascony, especially in Bergerac Blanc, there's a lot of Sauvignon Blanc. And in Burgundy, I don't know if many people know about Sambri, which is right near Chablis. It's a small outpost of Burgundy that is a Sauvignon Blanc only appellation. Really unique wines. Awesome. Maybe I'll see if we can add a Sambri to either the wine access page or to a shipment. I will definitely look into that. It's delicious. It's really different, especially for Burgundy. For the rest of the old world, we have Spain. Most of it is too hot for high quality Sauvignon Blanc and they are moving away from French grapes. They have a strong focus on their own native grapes. So yeah, you can use it in Rioja. You can use it in Castilla-La Mancha. It's used around Penedes. Mainly, it's found in Rueda, where it is blended with the native grape Verdejo. Now, it's much easier to grow than Verdejo. Rueda Sauvignon can be up to 85% Sauvignon Blanc. If you see a wine that just says Rueda on it, it can be up to 50% Sauvignon Blanc. Italy, it's always the story of the north. You sometimes see them in Sicily, but Sauvignon Blanc is in Piedmont, which used to be part of France. Gaia still makes one, very expensive. Alto Adige and Friuli also have lots of Sauvignon Blanc. That should make sense. There's some on the Slovenian border. They make some orange wines out of Sauvignon Blanc there. Austria is very interesting because Sauvignon Blanc is a small proportion of plantings, but Stiermark or Styria has recently been recognized for making amazing, rich, full styles with creaminess and flintiness and all of this delicious stuff. I could go on and on. Virtually every country in Eastern Europe grows Sauvignon Blanc. So I could tell you Bulgaria and Moldova and Romania and Greece, everybody grows it. So if you say you didn't mention blah, 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 these are the main areas Everyone else also grows it. So Ukraine grows it. Croatia has some. You know, we could go on and on. And Israel in the Middle East, Lebanon has some. So Sauvignon Blanc is literally everywhere. And then we move to the new world. We are going to talk about the other flagship. We had to spend a lot of time on Bordeaux and on the Loire since those are the main growing areas in France. But New Zealand, about 26,500 hectares, 65,600 acres. Sauvignon Blanc is 67% of the total planted area in the country of New Zealand. And 90% of Sauvignon Blanc is in Marlboro. Planted in the 1970s, I mentioned before, it was a trial plot that was planted by Montana. If you want to know more about the history of Montana and the history of Sauvignon Blanc, I would highly recommend listening to the podcast I did with O2 Wines, Jeff Clark. Fantastic episode where we discuss all of the ins and outs and the history of Marlboro. And he goes through Montana. He worked for he's worked for everybody. But Montana, which is today Brancott, was the behemoth. They were on the North Island. They decided Marlboro, hey, cheap place to plant. We're going to set up a plot. Let's make some quick buck off of Sauvignon Blanc in bulk. Or we could blend it with the very extremely popular and everyone knows and loves the Mueller Turgau that was so big then. This was going to be their dream. High yields, no expensive oak, doesn't age. It's great for getting the industry off the ground. Great to make a quick buck. 
1980, they made the first wine. By 1985, Cloudy Bay, which was the very famous wine, changed things for New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. People stood up and paid attention. New Zealand now became a major player in the wine world with Marlboro Sauvignon Blanc. Marlboro is ideal for Sauvignon Blanc. It is one of New Zealand's sunniest and driest regions. It's cool, but it has a lot of sunshine, so you can get ripeness. Perfect climate. There's diurnals. There's low rainfall. You have a long fall, an Indian summer. So this long ripening period is going to allow for great flavor development. You have the Wairau River that's bisecting the valley. So you have some water for irrigation. Richmond Ranges in the north. You have some foothills in the south. Those mountains are going to provide a rain shadow for extreme rain and wind that is going to come off the roaring 40s in the Pacific Ocean on the western side. So you can face the coast and get cool coastal breezes and yet still have enough sun to be able to ripen these grapes and not have wind damage in many places. The soils are very varied. So you have stone and sand, great drainage. There's some heavier soils of clay and silt for heavier wines, more herbal wines. Those stony soils are going to be warmer. You're going to get lush flavors. The key is really getting a mix of either places within the valley, the Awatiri and the Wairau are the two places that they source from. The Awatiri has silt loam and gravel and sand. These are acidic wines, herbal. They have that jalapeno pyrazine note like lime zest. Fewer tropical notes here. Even if you did a cool fermentation, you can't get that kind of ripeness out of Awatiri. And then you have the Wairau. The Wairau is both fertile and infertile soils, but they run east to west. So if you plant your vineyard north to south over those bands, you get a variety of soils. You have heavier soils in one area that's going to make those herbal wines. Lower down, you have stony soils that are going to make more plush, lush wines, so you can blend it all together to make a great wine. So Wairau and Awateri are the two main valleys for Sauvignon Blanc in Marlboro. Great wines, obviously a complete benchmark of this herbal grapefruit, sometimes cat pee, unfortunately, but they're really getting rid of that. They've done a good job of taming that note, the theols. And that's Marlboro Sauvignon Blanc, the most famous in the New World. The North Island also makes a little bit of Sauvignon Blanc. Hawks Bay, it's warmer. There's a lot of red wine there, so it's tropical and fuller bodied, sometimes oak aged. Wairarapa, especially in Martinborough, I mentioned, super small, more minerally herbaceous. Some tropical f- characters can be full, a little lower acidity. And then on the South Island, Central Otago makes very, very small amounts of minerally fruity Sauvignon Blanc. And then Nelson is sheltered from the strong winds, and it's east of Marlboro, restrained with minerality and tropical fruit and herbal notes. Sauvignon Blanc couldn't be happier in New Zealand, and most of us couldn't be happier to have New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. Great producers that maybe you haven't heard of, St. Clair, excellent producer, Dog Point, for you dog lovers, I think that's a fun one to have. Gray Wacky, most people probably seen Gray Wacky. It's named after the soil type that's here. Clo Henri, another one. Now you might expect, okay, well, what New Zealand does, Australia does, but no, no, because the climate is quite different in New Zealand versus Australia. New Zealand is cooler with more maritime influence. Australia can be quite hot. So in the cooler regions of Tasmania, some parts of the Yarra Valley and Victoria and south of that, Western Australia, the Margaret River, they blend it with Semillon there. Adelaide Hills in South Australia, you'll find pockets of Sauvignon Blanc, but really Australia has not put a lot of focus on it. I think they are perfectly happy to import from their neighbor. So we don't see a ton of Sauvignon Blanc from Australia. Chile. Chile is the other real benchmark style in the New World. It is a key white variety. It's 15,000 hectares, 37,000 acres. In the beginning, Chile brought grapes from Bordeaux in the late 1800s before Phylloxera. And one of the grapes that they brought was the white grape of Bordeaux, Sauvignon Blanc. Growing with Sauvignon Blanc was a grape called Sauvignon Vert. Chile planted these Bordeaux varietals in essentially what they didn't think was, but was a field blend. 
Sauvignon Blanc was not isolated correctly. So these two grapes looked alike. Chilean Sauvignon Blanc for a very long time was watered down. Sauvignon Vert does not have the flavor profile or the strength of character that Sauvignon Blanc has. And for a while, Sauvignon Blanc and Sauvignon Vert were considered synonyms, and this was very, very confusing. It makes sense how they had this confusion, but once they discovered it, it wasn't until the early 1990s, and already the reputation of Sauvignon Blanc in Chile wasn't great. Anything planted after 1995 is true Sauvignon Blanc. If you see somebody boasting that they have old Sauvignon Blanc vines, your ears should perk up because likely it's Sauvignon Vert. It's probably not Sauvignon Blanc. The climate in Chile is really great for Sauvignon Blanc if you keep it cool. Chile has a lot of hot areas, which is why the kid of Sauvignon Blanc does really well. Cabernet Sauvignon is perfectly happy there. But the Sauvignon Blanc vineyards that are close to the Pacific that are cool and dry, that are not wet, are going to be perfect. Areas that are strongly influenced by those cooling effects of the Humboldt current, that's that current in the Pacific Ocean that's coming up from the Antarctic and cooling down the entire Chilean coast, making it way cooler than you would expect. Cold afternoon breezes from the ocean. The mountains also contributing to that because Chile is this very long, narrow country. You have influences both from the Andes Mountains on the eastern flank and then on the western side, you have the Pacific Ocean. Longer ripening period. This is great for Sauvignon Blanc. Frost can be an issue, but when it doesn't come, it's great for Sauvignon Blanc. Planting used to only be based on climate, but now they've done a lot of work with soil tips. If you haven't looked at Chile in a while, I'm going to do the podcast next week on Chile so you'll learn more about it. But they've done a lot of work on soil types, slope, drainage, plantings, and wine quality improving. And it's such a great value. They have in the Casablanca Valley, which is really the leading region for quality Sauvignon Blanc, sandy clay soils that are well-drained. They have clay loam over granite. Granite tends to impart a lot of acidity in the areas of San Antonio and the Leda Valley, which are also excellent regions for Sauvignon Blanc closer to the Pacific. San Antonio and Leda are a little bit cooler, closer to the Pacific. They have spicier wines, maybe a little bit more pungent. If you don't like the methoxypyrazines, you may want to go for one from the Casablanca Valley. The places in the foothills of the Andes, it's too hot. But if they have sites that are too cool for Cabernet, you may find some in Maule or in Valle Central, really simple, basic wines. You want to look for things from Casablanca, Leda, or San Antonio, or in the north, Limari, has in the very far north in El Quay have great Sauvignon Blanc, also cooler climates, less intense than New Zealand, but fruitier than Loire. It's this Goldilocks wine. This balance of tropical fruit and savory flavors, those herb flavors are very strong often in Chilean Sauvignon Blanc. It's such a great deal. I highly encourage you to seek it out. Sometimes you'll get some green apple and pear notes. The mint can be strong, green pepper, can also be strong, but if you get a different version from the Casablanca, slightly warmer, you may get something more like thyme rather than green pepper. Sometimes Chilean Sauvignon Blanc is more tropical and maybe a little bit smoky, which is really delicious. They don't usually do malolactic fermentation, so the acidity is usually pretty high. Matatec is probably my favorite producer from Casablanca. Viña Leda, Caletera, Morande, Garce Silva, Amaina is another one. These are all from coastal producers. So you're going to find a little bit of Sauvignon Blanc in Argentina, in Brazil. What's called Sauvignon Blanc is usually Seval Blanc, which is a hybrid grape. South Africa, another great place for Sauvignon Blanc that is highly underrated. It's great. It's more restrained. It's less fruity than New Zealand, more herbal, great acidity. Elgin, Stellenbosch, Constantia, these are places to look. You have some that are more tropical with pineapple, guava notes, apricot, citrus, warmer climates of so Stellenbosch and Franschhoek and Parle, flinty, minerally wines that are like gunflint or waterfall or steel or smoke, even some mushroom that's in the temperate areas like Walker Bay or Overberg, Elgin. 
especially in the area of Elm in Cape Agulis, spicy and herbaceous wines. This is more the New Zealand style in very cold places in these cooling areas or at altitude, green pepper, asparagus, those kinds of things. Walker Bay, the South Coast. And then there's some other styles. You know, you'll always find things in the middle. Thorn and Daughters de Grindel. I want to find a Diemersdahl, but I can't find that wine anywhere. It's really hard to find. But if you're in the UK, you can find a Diemersdahl. It's supposedly the best Sauvignon Blanc in South Africa. Can't find it here, of course. So now we'll move to California. California has about 6,200 hectares of Sauvignon Blanc, 15,000 acres, mostly in Sonoma County, in Napa County, and in Lake County. There's some in the Central Valley. There's a little bit in Santa Barbara County. The problem for Sauvignon Blanc in California is it really doesn't have a benchmark style. It's made in all different styles. The most common style I find out of Napa is melon with floral, tropical notes. Sometimes they oak it. They call it Fumé Blanc. Robert Mondavi in 1968 bought some Sauvignon Blanc and decided that it was too grassy and put it in an oak barrel and called it Fumé Blanc to allude to Puy Fumé. But today is just a marketing name for Sauvignon Blanc. It doesn't even have to be in an oak barrel, so who knows? The cuttings originally came to California's Livermore Valley in the 1880s from Chateau de Chem, but it's definitely changed since then. Claude Duval in Napa, Mary Edwards in Sonoma, Frog's Leap, and there's a, there's a lot of others. It's not California's main focus. It's more of a cash cow so they can finance their aging of Cabernet Sauvignon. I am not a huge fan of California Sauvignon Blanc, although I do acknowledge there are definitely some delicious versions of it out there. Oregon has a little bit. Washington State, Texas, New York, Virginia. As I told you, Mexico, Canada, everybody grows Sauvignon Blanc. Just to wrap on the aging and food pairings, Sauvignon Blanc really is not meant to age. Sauterne and some Bordeaux, a little bit of Sancerre and Puy Fumé and even Marlboro can age for five to eight years. Bordeaux is maybe more like 10 to 15, 20 at the high end. But we're talking about wines that are not really for aging. So you just keep that in mind. The Sauvignon Blancs are really pop and pour. If you're going to spend a lot of money on it, just know it's for immediate pleasure. And there's nothing wrong with that. One of the best wines I've ever had is the Dagenau Silex from Puy Fume. And it is absolutely delicious. And it was a pop and pour wine. It wasn't like an aged vintage wine. These aren't forever wines. And maybe that's a good thing. I don't know. I mean, if we don't want to sit around and wait forever, get one that's a current good release and just drink it and enjoy it. And what are you going to enjoy it with? So food pairings, if you have something that's more minerally, raw or lightly cooked shellfish like oysters or shrimp, prawns, crab, gazpacho or tomato-based dishes is pretty good. Goat cheese is the best pairing for me. Sancerre or puy fumé with a good chevre, maybe an herbed goat cheese, delicious. Like literally the, one of the best pairings on planet Earth. What grows together goes together. Chevre is from this area. Some of the other goat cheeses that are from Sancerre and puy fumé area, yes, 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 and more yes. Citrusy Sauvignon Blanc, unoaked white Bordeaux or Chilean, grilled fish, with garlic, anything with garlic and citrusy Sauvignon Blanc is delicious. Fried fish or grilled chicken with herbs or with garlic. Lemon dressings, artichoke, yes. So hard to pair with so many different things, but an unoaked white Bordeaux or Chilean Sauvignon Blanc, delicious with artichoke. Thai food can also work. And then those grassy New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs, salads. And things that nothing else will pair with. Asparagus, peas, green pepper, lime stuff, and then manchego. Perfect for New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. Amazing, amazing. Oaked white Bordeaux is going to be more your cream sauces, pasta primavera, scallops, things with butter sauces. And of course, never serve your Sauvignon Blanc too warm. We usually serve our whites too cold. But in this case, a really minerally Sauvignon Blanc, you want to serve at 43, 45 degrees Fahrenheit or 6 or 8 degrees Celsius. You don't want to max it more than around 50 degrees Fahrenheit. It starts to get flat after a while. You want to keep that cold. Serve it in a small glass so you can keep refilling and keep it on ice and you will be happy. I don't need to tell you this. We all, almost all of us drink Sauvignon Blanc. This is not an obscure grape. So I've given you a ton of information. Maybe you didn't know that all these styles 
Bills existed. And maybe you listen to this thinking, I hate Sauvignon Blanc, but I'll listen anyway because I'm driving and I have nothing else to do and I don't mind Elizabeth's voice that much and you know, whatever. But hopefully at least something piqued your interest here because there are different styles. If you're a red wine lover, go for a Bordeaux Blanc. If you are somebody who really loves New Zealand, try South Africa or Chile. So there's ways to expand it out. Sancerre and Puy Fumé, look for Tasmania. Those are wines that are really crisp and delicious. There's some ways to fan out Sauvignon Blanc. Of course, there's other grapes that you can get, but Sauvignon Blanc is ubiquitous. It's delicious, so easy to enjoy, so easy to explain, and it's a complete crowd pleaser. So just like its kid, Cabernet Sauvignon, and unfortunately, unlike its partner, Cabernet Franc, which is much more obscure, Sauvignon Blanc is a total superhero in the wine world. I hope that you go out and get some new kind of Sauvignon Blanc. There's so much out there to explore, even within Sancerre. I've just given you three different soil types you could explore, and I promise you they all taste different. I've had all of them, and they all taste different. That's a cool experiment, too. Maybe, oh, maybe an idea for a patron hangout. Huh. Who knows? So that is Sauvignon Blanc, another one in the books for the great miniseries Refresh. And with that, this has been another episode of Wine for Normal People. Thank you so much for listening, and we will catch you next time.